around the end of the third century, so that's like uh, 250, 270, going up to 300, there started this phenomenon that people started to go out into the Egyptian desert seeking to find a life closer to God by being in solitude. So that starts with people like St. Paul of Thebes, who was maybe the very first one, who spent around 90 years in the desert and didn't see anyone until God revealed him to St. Anthony at the very end of his life. And of course you have St. Anthony the Great, who is considered the founder of all monasticism, and especially the founder of desert monasticism. He walked by a temple and heard the priest reading the gospel, and the gospel said, sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And St. Anthony heard this as directly an invitation to himself. And he did. He went and gave away everything that he had, and he took off for the desert. He spent some years under direction with a, an elder who lived outside the city, and then finally went into the complete desert, where no one had ever tried to live before, all by himself, and struggled there for many years with temptations from demons and struggling with uh, fasting and long prayers and keeping vigil all night. And people began to flock to him. And so then you get to around the year 300, you're getting into the fourth century. By now, thousands of people are starting to come out into the desert because they're seeking God. It's around the same time that Christianity gets legalized in the Roman Empire and start, starts becoming a more societal norm. It's just what people do. And although that's a beautiful thing, that they're free to worship without persecution, and they're building churches, and people all over the empire are converting to Christianity, but these people are afraid of growing complacent. They're afraid because before, during the period of persecution, uh, it was either... Either you're going to be a Christian, and you're most likely going to die for it, or else you're going to live a comfortable life and do what all the rest of society is and worship the idols. And so there was this life and death seriousness to Christianity during that time of persecution. And as it became the national religion, these people feared that they would lose that, that intensity. And so in order to preserve it, they ran to the desert where their lives were threatened by their very surroundings, where there was no water, where there was no food. There was nowhere to buy new shoes when your shoes ran out. There were lions and wild animals that still lived all around them. And it was a place that uh, pirates and barbarians were known to come through there. And it was a very dangerous place. And they precisely put themselves out into that very dangerous place because they knew that they would have no choice except to depend entirely on God. And living in that way, they would have no option but to think of God at all times, to pray to him at all times. And, and then they would know that every day that they live in the desert, is a miracle of God. It's a manifestation of his grace and his love for them. And so and so by, by the fourth century, they, they say that the city is becoming like a desert. Oh, <laughs> they say that the desert is becoming like a city. That thousands of people are moving out into the wilderness so that they can be closer to God. And so you get these wonderful fathers like St. Macarius the Great, St. Pacomius the Great, St. Theodosius the Great, and these are considered like the founders of the communal life, the founders of, of monasticism essentially as, as we have come to know it today. And they gathered communities and they taught them how to live in fasting and prayer, and many of them received their own directions from angels and from visions from God. 
And it's this incredible period of spiritual growth. Um, it, the same thing's happening in Palestine. There you have St. Sabbath, the sanctified, St. Anthemius the Great, um, St. Gerasimus, a lot more. So it's, it's, but it's the same idea. They're fleeing to the desert. They're fleeing to the wilderness where they have to depend upon God. And this movement of the Desert Fathers is, is really the main, where the real source of Orthodox spirituality begins to flower. And it's that same source that continues to our day. So we learn from the Desert Fathers, who spent their whole lives in this incredible struggle with spiritual warfare, we learned what spiritual warfare is. And for the thousands of years after them, for the next, you know, uh, 1700 years since them, we've had their instructions as to how you deal with spiritual warfare, how you succeed in the battle against the passions. It's in the Desert Fathers also that we begin to learn about the internal prayer and the prayer of the heart. And it's the beginning of the Jesus prayer. It's the beginning of Hesychia. So although maybe the, the real fruit, the real flowering of Hesychia, of silence, the practice of silence and watchfulness of thoughts and the prayer of the heart, although maybe that begins to really define itself in the 12th century or the 13th century, these things are coming from the tradition of the Desert Fathers. Our teachings on obedience, which is so central to the Orthodox life and Orthodox spirituality, it all, it all really was formed by the Desert Fathers and mothers. There were, there were women and women's communities out there too. And this is uh, one of our greatest treasures, this, this, this spiritual wealth that began to be developed by them. And it's one of the greatest treasures of the Orthodox tradition as a whole, that we don't have to figure all this stuff out anew for ourselves. Because for generations and generations and generations, people have been doing this. And they've been leaving us their knowledge that they gained while they did it. And so we don't have to start from scratch. We start from the end of where they stopped. And so they've passed down this huge, beautiful, rich, helpful tradition to us that teaches us what the spiritual life is, how we deal with spiritual warfare, how do we pray, how do we fast, why do we pray, why do we fast, all of that. It's, it's been given to us coming from these desert fathers and mothers. Um, but we have a bit of a dilemma because it's, we're, we're now in the 21st century. It's a long ways away from the desert fathers and Essentially, there's no wilderness left. Um, nowadays, there, there isn't... Nowadays, every piece of land is owned by somebody. And most of those people will take you to court if you try to go settle on them without getting their permission. So it's... We don't have that same idea. We don't have that same opportunity to flee to the wilderness. Um, I went with a group of students when we were about to graduate from Holy Cross. We went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and we went to some of these desert monasteries. We went to the monastery of Joseva and to Mar Sabas. And these places are unbelievable. Mar Sabas is built on the edge of a cliff above this, this huge canyon. And there's caves all throughout these rocks in this, this huge canyon. And our guide, when we were there, told us that at the height of the monastery, there might have been 600 hermits living in various caves throughout that huge canyon. And maybe they would all gather on Sundays, but most of them lived, although they were in this community of hermits, they lived secluded in this wild place where they could each have their own cave. And and this is this idea of the, the desert became like a city. There could have been a thousand monks in that area, but it was the wilderness. So we went there now in the 21st century, and there's bus loads coming in, bus after bus after bus. And there's um, 
Bedouins who are around trying to sell you jewelry and trying to sell you some scarves and trying to make a buck off of all the tourists. And you go into the monastery and it's, it's just packed full of people. There's no desert left anymore. All the places, uh, Egypt, these great centers of, of the original outpouring of monasticism in Egypt, the land is now ruled by Islam and is no longer a safe place for, for a Christian to, to go and live a life devoted to God. Um, and so what do we do? We don't have the same wilderness. We don't have that same opportunity. We are hemmed in on all sides by buildings and by um, property divisions, and, and there's, there's nowhere for us to go. So today we have a new desert. And for us in the modern age, our desert is our heart. In the modern days, our family systems have fallen apart and the result is that people's hearts are often left empty and isolated. As we live in this rise of technology, our whole world is becoming dehumanized. People don't have relationships with people anymore. They have relationships with things. And all of this it starves our hearts. And our hearts become barren and dry, just like the desert. And now our task is, as the early fathers fled into the wilderness, where they could only survive by the grace of God. There was no way that they could live in that wild, barren, dangerous desert, unless God was with them and helped them. Well, my friends, that place is now our heart, where we are filled with fears and pains and loneliness, and, and it often feels barren and empty. That is the place that we need to flee to now so that in that great need, we will become entirely dependent upon God. Now, if we try to do this by ourselves, if we try to do this without opening all of that need to God and waiting for him to fill it, then we will drown we will dry up in the desert of our hearts and it will kill us. But if we flee into the desert of our heart and wait patiently on God and call persistently on the name of the Lord, if we depend upon him to fill what is lacking in us, then we will be partaking in that same grace that the Desert Fathers lived off of. Now, it was an option for the Desert Fathers to run away from society to the desert. Just like it's still an option for people today to flee to the monastery or to live in the world. That's a choice for everyone. But... It's not an option as to whether we need to live in our hearts. That's a desert that all Christians must flee to. Because the grace of God at our baptism and chrismation, the grace of God comes and dwells in our hearts. And so St. Gregory Palamas, when he's writing his triads, this great defender of Hezekiah and the spiritual tradition. He says that 
not only is it good for us to make our dwelling inside of our hearts, but it's actually a sin if we don't. Because if we don't make our own abode within ourselves, then we are not going where God is. God comes to dwell inside of us, and we will find him in our hearts, and we will find our communion and our life with him in our hearts. And as long as we think that we have to live outside of ourselves, anywhere else, outside of here, then we are avoiding God himself. And we are choosing to leave the temple of the Holy Spirit empty while we dwell outside. So it's not, it's not just for the monks and the nuns, and it's not just for the ancients. This desert of our heart is somewhere that every Christian has to inhabit. And as we wait in that empty place and call upon the name of the Lord, his grace will bedew our barren desert. And it will bring life. And it will make fruit to grow in the desert. And in this way, we will be living the fullness of the spiritual life that has been taught us from centuries and centuries and centuries and generations of people who have sought God and found him.